Welcome back to the Football Fitness Federation podcast. This is episode 97 with Graham Henderson, the head of performance at Falkirk. Graham, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, Ben. Thanks very much and thanks for having me on today. No, I appreciate you coming on, mate. I've just said that, as always, we've had a conversation off air that I should have recorded. And I remember Cal Walsh saying this to me ages ago that need to start recording the conversations before we go on air. And he's dead right, because we just had a great conversation. That, that was the best part, Ben. It's all down here from here, that's us. <laughs> so the pressure's on now, mate. So the bit we haven't recorded, <laughs> that's sitting at a high level. So we've got to try and raise the bar. <laughs> well, let's dive straight in, mate. Let's go into, um, like we always do, into your career. Because I've just mentioned your role. Um, I know you've had some interesting roles at a few different clubs and... and um, It'll be great to dive into show your career path so far. So, do you want to take us back and then work up to what you're doing currently? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think for the majority of people in the game, I think we all kind of start off the same. We all want to be a professional football player. That's the, the dream. And like 99.9% .9 of people, you know, I wasn't good enough to make it. That's the simple answer. So, very quickly, I realised that I wanted to stay in the game. I wanted to be involved on a daily basis. Um, and that kind of led me into the, the coaching pathway uh, from a, an early age, kind of 17, 18. All the way from that early age, I always had an interest in coaching. I always thought coaching would be something I'd be involved in. But then sports science kind of grabbed my attention and this idea of, you know, how can we make players fitter, stronger, faster? And right away, I tried to mar the two together. And I was very fortunate to start off at my, my local club here in Scotland at Stirling Albion, um, who currently play in League Two, working in the academy. And it just, like a lot of people's careers, it became luck. And the first team manager at that point kind of noticed me and, what are you doing, son? Are you that sports science boy, right? We need the players to run, in you come. And that was my very first exposure to it. Um, from there, I moved on to a, a much larger club at Dundee United from a first stint there, working um, within the academy. And again, it was a different set of challenges because there was a little bit more pressure. Dundee United are a, a much bigger club. You know, players there will, will have expectations and ambitions, even at the young age group, of, of what they want to achieve in the game. And I learned quite a lot of, of the softer skills at that time in my career, I thought, in terms of you know, just simple things like organisation and, you know, how to, I thought at that point, put messages across and just kind of deal with players of, of a variety of different ages from 12 year old up to probably about 17, 18 at that point. Um, I recognised myself that I needed a better understanding of sports science, so I took a decision to go away, go and do a master's degree and it's probably one of the best things I've ever done. You know, I really thought that getting that postgraduate level of education and actually trying to think of things from a, a truly scientific research point and you know, having an opinion on things had a, a major impact on me. And again, I got a bit of luck at that point, finishing off the Masters, I, I managed to go to Partick Thistle um, and work with the first team squad there. Uh, at that point, the club won the Premier League um, and what a fantastic experience. You know, I was only what would have been 23, 24 roughly at that time. And some of the memories that I've got from that club and, and what we've done and what we achieved to stay in the league will live with me for the rest of my life. And it's interesting because now I look back, you know, eight years further down the line, and what a number of mistakes I made, Ben. You know, I'm going to put my hands up and admit it. There was mistakes left, right and centre because it was truly the first time that I'd worked with first-team players, a full-time environment. We had some some big names, certainly in the Scottish game at that point, of guys that had played Premier League level in England, guys that were Scotland internationals, or had been Scotland internationals, guys that had moved from down south, etc. And what a learning process. But again, for me, it's all been part of the journey. And, you know, it's about taking these points and moving them on as I've got older and as I've moved to different clubs and from Partick Thistle going back to Dundee United as a head of medical and sports science at the club. And that became much more strategic and much more focused on what's the overall view of the club and how do we want our players to look from a, a physical point of view and 
you know, you're talking all the way down to, to nine-year-olds up to, to the reserve team and guys that are breaking into the first team. So that was an enjoyable role in terms of actually having that strategy, having that overarching view and, and putting a philosophy in place. It's probably the first time I've thought about this idea of a philosophy at a club. Um, moving on from there, the call came to, to go back to first team level. I had to make a decision and, you know, working at that first team level was something that I felt I had a bit of unfinished business. As I said, loved every minute of Patrick Thistle, wanted to get back into it. Uh, I had a brief stint at Greenock Morton, then moved on to my current club at, at Falkirk, where I am just now. And the kind of last part of my career, the last 12, 18 months or so, I've managed to have a, a role with the Scottish FA and been involved with their coach education programme and having inputs on to UEFA B licence, UEFA A licence, elite youth licences, and I know it's something we're going to talk about later on in the podcast, but again, I think it's great to see now sports science and coaching kind of coming together. Yeah, definitely. And I think it'd be good to dive in. I know we're going to go on to your current role in a second, but just to start with, I think it'd be good to discuss some skill sets you think are important because you've been at the academy level and then, like you said, you've got been at first team level numerous times. What do you think some of the key um, attributes that practitioners have to develop to work with, first of all, academy players, but then when they go into working with full uh, with professional um, players, if they do, if that is something that they want to do? Yeah, I think, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're academy level, first team level, whatever it is you're doing, I think the first key skill you have to have is, is be personable and you have to be able to build relationships and, um, you know, it was a great, great clip from Tony Strudwick going back a few months and he spoke about the modern day player and about, you know, rather than maybe trying to speak to them or show them something on paper, it was it was via mobile phone apps and it was via, um, you know, all this kind of technology. So, and again, you know, I kind of talked about my mistakes before in the past and that ability to build relationships rather than maybe going in heavy handed and saying, right, you must do X, Y, and Z, because if you lose a player, you're never, ever going to get them back. And I think it's something that, you know, whether you're a sports scientist, a coach, a physio, a, a goalkeeping coach, whatever it is, you have to work with people on a daily basis. So for me, that's, you know, no matter what level you're working at, that's a key thing. I think at the academy level, you've got to be very good in terms of your, your strategies, your organisation, particularly if you're working with, various age groups, you know, you might have maybe the under-14s, under-15s, under-16s, particularly up in Scotland, you could have the full academy you're working with, maybe different at the larger clubs in England where you're maybe one or two squads, but, you know, you've got to be organised, what is it, who am I working with today, it's the under-16s, what's their session, what does that individual player need, right, okay, and breaking it down for, for those players at that level, you know, again, I think, as society even, we're, we're guilty of speaking to, to young players and to children as, as adults. You know, they're, they're not going to understand some of the things that we're trying to get across as adults and some of the kind of pressure and factors that, that we know comes with adult life. So it's having that ability to take things and put it into that kind of kid-friendly or, or youth-friendly language. You know, obviously that changes as, as the players progress and they head towards the first team. Maybe we can be that little bit tougher and maybe we can use maybe more adult-based terms and learning. But I think as well the key point, and particularly in academies, and I see it a lot when players come into first team level, what's their experience of sports science been? And if they've had a great experience, it makes our job so, so much easier. But if they've had a bad experience or you know, maybe they've picked up an injury or maybe they've not got on with a sports scientist within their academy setting, you almost have to break that wall down and start again and start afresh. So I think we need to make sure that idea of relationships, that idea of getting players on board and helping to educate them. And go back to that comment from Tony Strudwick, how do we educate players? You know, I could sit and speak to a 15-year-old player for an hour. They're probably only going to take two or three minutes of that conversation away with them. So what's the key points from that? And Again, even at first team level, we don't have an hour to sit down and speak with, with first team players. Yes, they're maybe a bit more direct and 
the demand certainly a lot more because three points are at stake or there's a, a cup game or there's bonuses or you know, whatever the situation might be depending on the club you're at and we kind of touched upon Liverpool uh, in the pre-conversation and the pressure that some of their players were under to, to win this league this season etc but we've got to again try and put information across try and do it quickly try and make sure the players understand and it all kind of links back to that knowing your players and probably the last one at first team level is time constraints. You know, you're, you're very, very limited. The minute a player comes into the training ground, they might have to do stuff for the press, for the PR department. They might have to go and see the physio. The manager might want five minutes with them to talk about the previous performance. Then they're doing prehab. Then you're on the pitch. Then it's lunch. There may be an afternoon session. They maybe have to get away to get kids or do more PR work or... So you've got to be very, very good with your time and manage and how you get that message across because, again, that's our role, is to try and help players no matter whether they're at the academy level, the first team level. It's just us trying to support that player in their performance. Yeah, definitely. We talk, Loads of people touch on their mistakes on the podcast and I think, I think we have to, we said it quite a few times, that I think people have to go through that, don't they, to experience these things because that's how we develop as practitioners but where you're touching on communication being one of the mistakes that you'd made I think a lot of people and probably majority of coaches that's where they'll they will make mistakes of some sort whether it's communication with a coach or a player or if you go to academy level a parent um, yeah. I think that's definitely like a common one isn't it that you learn from or you have to learn from pretty fast yeah, I mean, I can remember and it's that communication side and how you deal with players. And you know, I remember being at Partick Thistle and we had a player, and the player's actually went on to have an exceptional career. You know, he's he's done brilliant, and um, he hated the gym, hated it, didn't want to do it. And I remember having an argument with him in, in the gym in front of other players and finding them and saying, "No, you will do this gym session." And you know, I look back now and I think, what was I thinking? What was I trying to do? What was I trying to prove? That, you know, I had to take a different tact with the player. You know, it had to be a conversation of, why do you not want to do the session? What do you feel is wrong with it? Right, okay, you don't like doing deadlifts because you've had an injury. Right, well, in that case, let's change the exercise. Or let's try and do something where you feel comfortable, you're going to get a benefit out of it, rather than the two of us just arguing back and forward about who's right, who's wrong, and... And it's funny because to this day, we have a great relationship and you know, we're in touch every so often and we talk away, but it's, it's that mistake and that light bulb moment. And particularly for, for practitioners that are starting out their career, you, know, you, you can't be afraid of making mistakes because if you are afraid of making mistakes, you're never going to push yourself out of that comfort zone and you're never going to, to push players into areas where you know, we can get high overloads and we can get that type of adaptation we want so yes yeah, it's, it's something you learn from and like I said it was a mistake you learn from it and you know touch wood I've never done it again so and that's the most important thing isn't it that we learn from them we we sort of cr we can cr critique our own practice but then progress it at the same time I think uh, where you talked about players uh, questioning players sports science experience or their experience in the gym or whatever I think that's a great point because there's loads of players isn't there that you'll come across that you get in a gym environment or you're going to be doing a running drill with them and they've had poor experiences in the past but that poor experience has meant that every single gym session is not worth it or they're going to end up too sore or whatever it is so it's a really important role you're playing isn't it to educate and find a way of working with them yeah, and absolutely. And again, just you know, kind of a couple of examples there. We had, you mentioned the gym. Uh, we signed one player from a club, a very high level club, an elite club, and the player came in right away. Hi, how you doing? Great, okay. Listen, we're going to start on this program just to get a little feel for, for how you move, what you do. And have you done squats before? Yeah, not a problem. We've done them. Fine, fantastic. Give the player the program. Turned my back for 10 seconds because then our player had to ask something. I turned around and I don't know what the player was doing, but it wasn't a squat. And it, it was that moment where, whoa, stop, stop, stop. What are you doing? Well, I'm squatting. Right, put the bar back. 
Yeah. And, oh, you've always squatted? Yeah, yeah, I know I've done this for the last five years. The bars are uneven, the heels are off the floor, the knees are shaking out to the side. And as you said, what that player has then been doing for the last five years, what's actually happened? Is there an increased risk of injury? Have they developed muscle imbalances? And it's almost going back to the start. And I think that's where it's quite funny now looking back and reflecting because for any practitioner that's working at first team level, it always helps to have that experience off academy level because for that player, it was almost like an academy player where you took them right back to the very start in terms of this is a basic squat or a wall squat or a squat without any weight and you know really building that technique up. So that ability to, to have the experience and as you say, look at what the player's doing and try and communicate that and maybe try and rectify some of what their experiences have been it becomes a massive part of, of your role. Um, and even another player we had who would come into training every day and he used to come in with a, a four pack of Red Bull, four cans. And every morning he would, he would drink these four cans. And I think it was maybe about after two or three weeks, I kind of clocked it and I said, do you do that every morning? Or, you know, are you feeling okay today? Yeah, just my normal routine. And it's that education process where you can't just say, give me that, that's banned. Because right away you've got conflict, right away if there's any decrease in performance, it's an easy cop out to say, well, I've not had my Red Bull. So again, linking it back to the academy and the habits you form in the academy, how do you educate players and slowly try and, and win them round and slowly try and maybe show them that there may be a better way of, of doing something. Yeah, the phrase that always sticks in my mind ever since I spoke to him on the podcast is Nick Grantham, where he said, nudge the culture along. And that always sticks with me, that those little things that you can think as being insignificant in a way of changing these habits with players, if you're constantly dripping these in every, every, um, everywhere that you see fit, it can, that's where it has the big impact, isn't it? Like you said before, if you go in like a steam train and try and change everything, and this is the program, this is my way or the highway, it doesn't work and we have to come to that pretty quick to have that impact, don't we, with players? Yeah, and again, it's, it's these little things that, that can make a difference. It's, I mean, you know, we talk about football and it doesn't matter what level you're at, if it's English Premier League, Championship, Scottish Premier League, whatever, the majority of teams will be of similar level, similar ability, similar budgets and it's these tiny, tiny margins and again, that's where I think we're seeing more and more of this idea of performance culture and you know, heads of sports science, heads of performance, whatever kind of title people want to throw at it. And it's about pulling all these kind of areas together to, to have that impact on the pitch because ultimately that's why we're employed, to help players perform better, to help the team perform better and to help the club perform better. Um, so again, as you said, that little nudge might just be the tiny percentage where the ball goes in the net as opposed to hitting the post or the player is able to sprint and get that extra half a yard to, to win possession or whatever it might be on a match day. And, then, and we wanted to dive into your role. So head of performance at Falkirk is, you, is your current title, but I know you've been head of performance elsewhere and worked in numerous different roles, including academy roles like you've mentioned. But we've spoke before on the podcast again about the role of head of performance and you touched on it a little bit then in terms of overseeing things and, and making these changes to have the impact on the pitch but what are people that are not in that role yet and they potentially want to step up to a head of performance role eventually what are some key things that they need to consider or key things they need to be aware of in, in your current role I think and I'm sorry I'm going to go back to this one again but relationships communication dealing with not just your own little sports science follow becomes vitally important. Again, Scotland, what's different, we have smaller budgets, we have obviously less income, less money, less staff than um, some of the bigger clubs down south. But within a performance role, you know, I've got to deal with the management team on a daily basis, discussing what's going to happen on that day, discussing uh, various players, whatever it may be. So that's one form of relationship. Then got to work very closely with the head physiotherapist and you know, maybe looking at player availability percentages and injury rates and what can we do in terms of that. So 
that's another relationship and it's almost a different skill set because if the management team, you know, we're talking in a, a technical, tactical, you know, everything just solely on that pitch for 90 minutes. With the physiotherapist, we're talking more from a medical standpoint point in terms of injuries, injury prevention, player wellness, availability. And one of the key, key things, and again, it's something that you know maybe the pennies dropped for myself during my career is the relationship you have with, with the board and the directors and particularly the finance director when you need money and you've got to chat that door. But how do you get that message across? And you know, it's, I can remember going back to the early career and the mistakes I made. And I remember producing a, a GPS report. I think it was maybe about the second or third day we'd got a GPS system into the club. And I kid you not, Ben, I think it was about 125 pages. I must have just <laughs> went for the biggest report, hit print and says, yep, that's the one. Great. There you go, Gaffer, read that. <laughs> I think he got to about page one and then binned it. But... You know, it's the same with board members. How can we break down what we actually do? And some of the stuff that I've been doing recently, and I think um, it's a really great tool, is this idea of player availability and player percentage availability. And, you know, again, looking at our squad, percentage availability um, the last season was somewhere around about 91%. So that means that 9% of the time, players aren't, haven't been available. So actually, what does that equate to in terms of, of our budget? You know, how much are the players earning? How much are we paying out for players that aren't any use to us at that point because they're injured? They're not going to have an impact on the pitch. And it's that kind of powerful message where going to the finance director and saying, look, we have spent X amount in wages on players that are injured. If I can get 10% of that back, to invest within, whether that be um, equipment, whether that be staffing, whether that be education, you know, we train a 3G pitch every day, so whether that be that um, upgrades to that, whatever it is, then that becomes a key part of the role. And you really have to be able to, to walk between all these different areas and factions and think, right, how do I communicate with that person? How do I communicate with that person to try and get my message across? And, Players is a key one. You know, I've spoken about all these different people, but at the end of the day, if we can't work with players, we're not going to get anywhere. We're not going to get any type of success. So you know, what I say to the finance director will obviously be a lot different to, to what I say to the club captain or what I say to one of the young players that's just trying to break into the first team or, or so on and so on. I think that's a great point. I love the, the um, language to the directors and that's so important, isn't it? Knowing your audience, like you say, the way you, you just said it there, the way you speak to an academy player is different to a first team player and first team player different to a, a manager or a coach. And then that'll be different to directors. And you've got to understand who's in front of you and what they want to hear as well. Like you talking about um, how much it will cost a club for a player being off the pitch makes complete sense to someone sat up in a boardroom rather than you getting out a graph and showing um, player avail availability and not giving the um, context to that person, isn't it? Yeah, it's again, kind of goes back to what we said at the very start and about relationships and how to, to deal with people and you know, also time's precious, you know, whether you're a director, whether you're a manager, whether you're a physio, if you work in football you don't have long periods of time to sit and have two of our conversations about, well, maybe we should do this or maybe we should do that. You've got to be able to get that message across really quickly. And, you know, to paint a really maybe extreme example, but on a match day, when it comes to a match day and maybe you're thinking, watching the, the game unfold, that actually that player maybe isn't moving properly or I can really start to see signs of fatigue in that player. And it's about, well, how do you pass that on to the management team? And how quick could you get that message across? And, you know, again, I've been very fortunate with the managers that I've worked with. They've all been extremely open to, to sports science input or, or input um, in terms of for myself. And I know that can be a really difficult one because of maybe the culture 20, 30 years ago where, as I've said, sports science, we were in our own little furlough. We just took the players for warm-ups, gym sessions, keep your mouth shut, that was it. Whereas now I think there is a place for us to, 
to put information in and to try and help that process and try and maybe uh, inform the decision making at, as I've said, all these various levels at the club. But you know that match day in terms of time constraints and pressure, and you're not going to get more of a a real situation in that. And that's where again we need to be confident in what we're saying and we need to get that message across. Five seconds, bang, because the manager's watching the game. He's not got time to turn to you and say, that's a really good point, Hendo, and yeah, what do you think about this? And, but sorry, it's, it's short, it's sharp, the message is across, and, and that's it. And that's a great um, way of leading into the next part, mate, because what we wanted to talk about was the importance of coaches, and when I say coaches, it, this could be technical, sports science, S&C, understanding one, one another's role. And, and their, um, their knowledge, their experience and everything that's got going on. And you've, you've made it very real there talking about a match day and, um, and communicating with a manager. But that's, that's real life, isn't it? So let's just start on the importance of sports scientists, strength conditioning coaches, understanding the technical side. And I know, I think I'm right in saying that um, you're UA4A licensed coach. Yeah. Um, so you've obviously, that's obviously been a priority for yourself. And so what do you think, the, how important do you think it is? I think the way the game has, has progressed and, you know, the game's only going to keep progressing and moving forward and becoming faster and you know, we're going to have more kind of ideas about tactics and everything else from, from coaching staff. I think it's essential. And I think that, you know, we could have the greatest sports scientist in the world but if they can't actually link what they're trying to do to the game of football, I don't think they're going to be very successful within football. You know, and that's where, again, maybe going back 20, 30, 40 years ago when sports science first started off and clubs would bring in a running coach, an athletics coach to deal with that. And, you know, we're now kind of trying to change that culture of it's not just a fitness coach. It's not just an SEC coach. And that's part of our responsibility as well. As practitioners, we need to go and, and learn the game as well. You know, it shouldn't always be a case of, oh, you know what, I've got my master's, I've got my doctorate, I've got basis accreditation, whatever it is. Yeah, I'm, I'm able to go and work in football. You know, we need to have that kind of responsibility to say, I want to understand the game. I want to learn about it. And I think from that point of view, it gives us so much more kudos and so much more credibility because we can actually show that what we are trying to do links to the game. And a lot of the work that um, Paul Bradley's done, you know, stuff like that for me is excellent because there's different levels of knowledge of the game. And, you know, we could have that level where we say the fullback is going to do 800 metres high intensity sprint in a game. Okay, and that's great. And you would know, pinpoint that position because we know they're going to get up and down. Fantastic. But let's delve in it a little bit more. How are they doing that high intensity running? Is it overlaps? Is it underlaps? Is it recovery runs? Is it having to go and cover for the centre back? Is it maybe um, a tactical thing where we always go down one side of the pitch, so that full back's always got to come inside? You know, again, it's, it's that level of detail. And I think when as sports scientists, we have that knowledge, that level of detail. It really opens the door for those conversations with coaching staff, management teams, um, heads of academy, whoever it may be, where, you know, we can sit around the table. And again, you know, the manager is the most important person at a football club. They will always make the ultimate decisions on team selection or training or whatever it may be. But as sports scientists, we want to try and have some kind of input in that. And by no means are we trying to take over or, you know, that kind of idea of sports scientists and they want to run the game. And you know, it's quite funny because we've had a few comments recently in Scotland about um, a manager that went down south and sports scientists dictated everything. That's, for me anyway, not what our role is. Our role is to try and link physical capacities to the game. And by having that understanding of but what happens when we change formation? What happens when we put that player in there? What happens when you actually, instead of getting the striker to come short all the time, we ask him to go and spin into the channel? How does that change what we're trying to do? 
you know, that's when really it becomes a much clearer picture for, for everybody involved at the club. And a lot of what um, we talk about on the Scottish FA courses uh, in terms of the B licence, A licence, periodisation, conditioning, etc. And I spoke to some of the candidates on the, uh, the A licence recently and we spoke about styles of play. And, you know, this coach, I want to play this way and this coach, I want to play this way. And one coach says, counter-attack. Yeah, I'm all about counter-attack. And, and that's great, but well, what does that mean from a physical point of view? Well, we need players that are very quick. So we need that high maximum speed. We need to realise that there's going to be a lot more sprints in the game because we're constantly, as soon as we win it, you know, we're going up, we're going long. The distance of the sprints is going to change. Normally in football, it's that kind of shot, 10 metres, whatever it may be. If we're a counter-attacking team, players are going to be running 30 metres, 40 metres, going box to box. So again, if we've got that additional knowledge that we can then bring to the table, it just makes the picture so much clearer for, for everybody involved about how do we try and improve performance and make it better. And I think that's why, you know, we're starting to see more and more sports scientists going on the coaching pathway. Um, you know, there's a, a couple that do have the, the UEFA Pro license. Adam Owen, obviously just been appointed at uh, Seattle Sounders. He was maybe the kind of the leader, the trailblazer in terms of going through that coaching pathway alongside sports science. But I think the more and more as time goes on, you know, more sports scientists will look to go and and do B licenses, A licenses, whatever it may be, to, to kind of cover that gap. And and just your opinion on that, what what sort of level do you think they need to go to? Like, do you think A license, uh, the coaches need to go to A license, B license? What this is just um, my curiosity, really. I think it really depends on the individual himself. You know, I think we all have a a knowledge of the game, no matter, you know, if we've watched the game of football, been involved in it, everybody's got an opinion. But again, it's about, well, actually, how much more knowledge do I need in my role? I would certainly think that moving forward, I would, I would encourage practitioners to at least try and maybe go and achieve a UEFA B licence because having been involved in the courses, it does give a really good grounding of that process of putting a training session on, looking at the tactical themes, thinking about, you know, how do you engage with fellow coaching staff members? How do you then try and get that across on the pitch? Because again, although we say we're sports scientists, our practitioners, our performance um, coaches, whatever, think how much time we spend on the pitch delivering. You know, we do warm-up sessions, we maybe take fitness sessions for want of a better term, we do individual sessions, so we are on the pitch quite a lot delivering, so it makes sense to have that that grounding. You know, my plan, I eventually would like to do my, my UEFA Pro licence, that's, that's the kind of end goal for me, and that's just because I want to learn more and more. You know, I want to develop more, I want to get as much knowledge of the game as I can, but that might not be for every sports scientist. You know, it's it's just about having some level of knowledge. And I think a lot of people would go on a B licence and actually enjoy it and yeah. think, you know what, that was brilliant. And again, one of the things that Scottish FA do really well is that they, they bring people together. And there is coaches from America, South Africa, China, all different experiences, all different backgrounds. You know, you've got people that have won Champions Leagues that are on these courses. You have people that are working at grassroots clubs. And just to kind of actually hear out with your own club, you know, I work at, at Burnley or I work at Norwich or Wolves or whoever it might be, and that's all I think about. Well, actually, what's happening at a club in Australia? What's happening out in America in the college system? Mm -hmm. Right, that's interesting. Can I then bring that back into sports science at my own club? Uh, it's good from that point of view as well. Definitely. No, I was, I was just intrigued, but I think that's a, gr a great answer. Like, uh, people need to experience it, don't they? And even if it just justifies the reasons why you do things, then surely that's a, as good a reason as any to go and do these things. And if it questions your practice, that's a good thing as well. Um, yeah, 100%. But, Again, I'm sure maybe a lot of people listening to this have, have heard the comment before from a player as well, but what do you know about football? 
And right away, listen, I'm not, I've never been a player, I'm not, but actually I've went and done this bit, you know, I've got a coaching qualification. So it just gives you that little bit more, um, as I've said, kudos, a little bit more backup that well, what I'm seeing does link to the game. No, definitely. And then just to switch that, in terms of the importance of the technical coaches understanding sports science. And I know that this is a completely different debate in terms of we've got UA for A, UA for B on the coaching side and on the sort of sports science s and there isn't that sort of pathway there yet. And I know there's a lot of people doing a lot of hard work to try and get something in place. So hopefully in the future there will be. But what do you think in terms of a technical coach? What, what does their understanding of sports science have to be? I, th I think you've made a really brilliant point, Ben, about that kind of pathway. And, you know, we have mentioned you could have a sports scientist with a master's, a PhD, basis accreditation, UKSCE accreditation. You know, there's so many different kind of facets and ways that people can, can be involved in that field. And it must be so difficult for a manager or a coaching staff if they have 20 CVs in front of them to say, what what's this guy's qualifications or what's this girl's qualifications for for this job we've got? So just kind of to go to that point first, I think you're spot on and you know hopefully there is going to be things come out and I think maybe UEFA might get involved and we might have some kind of um, fitness coach award or whatever it may be. But you know just kind of to have that that stamp and no bases are are now really coming into the fold and well, that's great for for us to have as practitioners is that kind of rubber stamp. So I think that's something that hopefully will happen very shortly and maybe will help the staff from the, the coaching side of the game. But I think it's encouraging as well, as I've said, that some of the coaching courses, and it's, it's not just Scotland, but you know, obviously I'm talking about that from, from being here, but FAs are starting to see that coaches need this understanding. You know, they need to have a, a realisation of, sports science can have an impact on the game. You know, it's not suddenly going to, to change a player from a £2 million player to £120 million player, but it can have that impact where we can get more out of the player because what they can do physically, their ability to use their body, whatever it may be. So I think the fact that it's embedded in coaching courses now, and you know, I've mentioned some of the topics that we talk about up here, periodization, which has become a massive kind of topic of discussion in terms of tactical periodization and periodization old school previous models and you know where does that go how does that look what's right what's wrong and part of what I love is I, I generally don't think there's a, a one size fits all answer mm. you know I think we have to have debate and we have to have kind of this is what I believe in but maybe the coaching staff want this or maybe this club want this and we have to tweak it and change it and, and find out what's best for us because if there was a perfect answer, every club would train the same way. Yeah. We'd all do the exact same training, exact same drills, exact same time and you know, we, wouldn't need, we wouldn't need sports scientists. So It'd be pretty boring though, wouldn't it? A hundred percent. Players would complain every day that we're doing this again, but I think that kind of, that debate is healthy. Mm. And if Going back to your kind of original question, if coaching staff do have an idea of sports science, and you know, I've mentioned about periodization there, or maybe conditioning, or GPS, you know, 50 meter sprints, or whatever it might be, it almost allows them to maybe question us more and allow us to reflect more. And, you know, maybe the manager might come to me and say, Well, listen, I've actually looked at the GPS, and, you know, a sprinting distance was well below what what you'd expected. Why was that? Well, it was because the serious signs or because we changed this or whatever it might be. But, you know, if they've got that understanding, it allows that to be conversation as opposed to that kind of mistake I made, 125 page document and it ends up in the bin. Mm. You know, it, there's no conversation there. So it really, I think is an exciting time for, for sports science in terms of the exposure that it's getting, the, the integrated approach that a lot of clubs are now taking and a lot of coach education systems are, are now using it within and bringing in um, tutors and uh, people from, from club settings to, to speak to coaches about that. 
And in the kind of last part, particularly if there's anybody that's listening that's at a part-time club or a grassroots club that maybe they don't have a sports scientist. Mm -hmm. So not only are they the manager, not only are they the coach, they're also the sports scientist, they're also the head of performance, you know, they're also probably the, the team liaison officer, the social media expert, all these other different roles. But mm -hmm. for them particularly, that little bit of knowledge could go a long, long way to helping them in whatever kind of level they're, they're at. No, I think it's a great point. It's always a pet peeve of mine when you hear some managers talking, saying, oh, they don't believe in sports science or whatever. And you're like, what? Well, again, it ties into what you said about before. What's their, when, when you were talking about players, this also relates to managers. Like, what's their experience been? Because yeah. if you had the relationship with that manager and you could give them the information when they need that information, then surely that's a good thing. Whereas if their experience has been bad and some people have, have tried to impose their thoughts or philosophies on things maybe a bit too hard, like, or push things that the manager didn't necessarily believe in, then there's an issue there. But again, it ties into exactly what you were saying before. That's a problem and an issue with the communication and the relationship, isn't it? But I think as well, you know, that point being about that kind of manager that comes out and says, I don't believe in sports science or I hate it or whatever, but that term sports science, it could mean so many different things. And, you know, if you were to sit down with that manager and question them and say, okay, that's, you, know, you don't like sports science, that's fine, 100%, but, well, how do you plan your training? Yeah. Well, on a Monday, we do this, on a Tuesday, right? Okay, so, so that's periodization. That's yeah. a part of sports science. And how do you work out, how long do you do your possession uh, 8v8 for? Well, I do it for two minutes and I get a, a one minute break and, okay, so you're, you're working off energy systems there and conditioning work, so, so that's sports science. Okay, and, and, and what food do your players get after games? Or will they get this? Okay, so that's nutrition. So it's, it's trying to break down these barriers and you know, that is as much our responsibility as, as coaches. We yeah. need to be open. We need to uh, be accepting of, of feedback and criticism as well. And you know, like I said at the start of the podcast, we all make mistakes. And we make mistakes, managers might have a go, they might shout at us, they might, you know, say unpleasant things in the heat of the moment, but you just got to take it and say, yeah, fair enough, mm. next time it's got to be better, or next time I need to make sure that um, it ties in with whatever the session is, or you know, whatever the issue might be. It, it can't just be one way, it's got to be a two-way street where we have to be open to criticism and feedback and just accept at times it's a gaffer's choice and, and that's the way it is. Mm. No, definitely. And, and just a final thing I wanted to touch on because I didn't want to miss this out and there's loads of areas that we could go into with yourself and I really appreciate you being so open on, on everything, Graham, because I think there's been some great information in there. But I think this will tie in with a lot of coaches, whether they're in a part-time role, like you said before, whether they're at an academy, a budget constraints and and I know it's something that you guys um, face up there and a lot of people are in that same sort of situation I've spoken to a lot of people that are going through this this same struggle and especially now I think after post-covid and clubs we've already seen already clubs have openly come out and said that they're financially struggling so I think coaches are going to have to get used to some of these extra challenges that they're facing so how, what are some considerations that we need to make as a head of performance, as a sports scientist, in terms of um, not relying on too big a budget? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, budgets are always, always going to be something that we, we just simply have to deal with. And you know, I kind of spoke earlier about that conversation with the finance director, whoever it might be at the club. And it's something that we always want more. You know, we always want more money for the latest piece of equipment or to buy in expertise or whatever it might be. And the key thing for me is we've got to prioritise and we've got to say, right, I want this wish list of 10 things, but actually what is going to get me the, the best bang for my buck and what is going to have the biggest impact on performance? So is it putting more money into the, the food budget? and improving the quality of the player's breakfast, the player's lunch, or is it buying a gym aware so that I can monitor things in the gym and power development and force, et cetera? Or is it upgrading the GPS system? Or you know, is it 
buying in more supplements because again it's funny supplements you know I've I've used a couple of different companies as one I've used for a long period of time now that I think is is the right one for, for what I try to do and what we do at clubs but you can get a player come into your club and right away they see a logo oh I'm not drinking that you know I don't like that so you've actually budgeted and you've went and spent money for or buying that player protein shakes energy gels whatever it may be and right away that's not going to be any use because the player won't take it, they won't drink it, they won't use it just because back to what we spoke about a lot during today, that past experience, that negative experience. So definitely we have to prioritise. One of the things that I've been very fortunate about with my career as well is, is contacts and actually going out your way to go and speak to people and communicating with people. And you know, I've been fortunate enough to visit a lot of clubs down south, see what they are doing. Okay, you know, I remember going to one Premier League club and they had a, it was a ramp kind of pyramid for, for incline running. And they says, you know, we've got this. And I think it was something like £200,000 they spent on it. Now, for me up in Scotland, that's never going to a happen. A few hills but... are there, though. <laughs> <laughs> plenty of hills and plenty of rain. <laughs> again, you know, you're thinking, wow, that's, that's a lot of budget. But as you said, Ben, Right, thinking cap on, actually, not far from where we train, there's hills. I've just saved myself 200 grand. Excellent. Now what can I spend that money on? And education, you, you can't put a price on education. And for me, it's about working smarter. And, you know, I'm very fortunate. I've got good relationships with, with quite a lot of um, sports scientists and people like Ian Call, who I know you had on your your show um, a few months back but speaking to these people getting ideas how do they do it at their clubs right okay well I can't afford that but actually right I might do it a different way and I mean one example of that is health and well-being apps and again you can go out there and you can spend thousands and thousands of pounds a year to go and have your app and get players to enter data we don't have that budget so I've had to go away and, and create my own app. You know, I've had to do it using Google Sheets and Google Forms. And again, that's money that's been saved into the budget. So we can then spend it elsewhere. And, you know, it's not just practitioners in the field. Go and speak to universities. What's your local university? What equipment do they have? What kind of partnership can you, can you build with them? Because you'll tend to find that they'll have equipment to measure VO2 max, they'll have Biodex, they'll have King Kongs, they'll have um, one university had a cryotherapy chamber, all these different things. So you might have to go out, you might have to give up some of your time, you might have to maybe try and take interns on board and upskill them. But at the end of the day, it's just back to that idea of you know, working smarter and prioritising and saying, right, what is going to be the best for us in terms of getting performance improved on the pitch and you know let's not lie us spending half a million pound on a couple of cryotherapy chambers or us spending half a million pounds on a striker the half a million pound striker is going to have a bigger impact for Falkirk Football Club and the cryotherapy chambers so the more money that I can save the more money that then goes into the manager's budget for player recruitment wages staffing everything else so we always want to be greedy and COVID could actually be, in some extent, a good thing for us as practitioners because now, sorry, but you don't have X amount of pounds to spend. How are you going to work smart and adapt and, and get the best out of players with that limited budget? I think that's a great point. Absolutely great point. I think there's, there's um, when you're talking about universities and interns and stuff, like if people aren't doing that, I think it's a massive area that they're missing out on. And you've mentioned a few names there of people you've reached out to, but it's using your network as well, isn't it? Because if you reach out to someone and you say, we're thinking of getting this bit of, this bit of tech or whatever, and they say, well, I won't, I won't bother. I'd, I'd maybe save that money and, and use it elsewhere. Then that's, that saved you money again. And you're just going on other people's experience. And someone like Ian, perfect example, Previously at Celtic, obviously a, a bigger budget now over in Bulgaria and not not as much, um, not as big a budget over there. And I'm sure he's took a load of lessons from what he did at Celtic over over there and applying it too. 
Yeah, and again, you know, I think it's brilliant to see things like this, Ben, where, you know, we have a, a sports science podcast, you know, whatever you want to call it, where maybe people haven't heard the name Ian Call or, you know, whoever it might be, and it allows people to open that door. And, you know, again, I go back to kind of bring it through circle the start of my career. You just had to go and try and approach people and, you know, listen, nine times out of ten you didn't get a response or, you know, maybe sorry, I'm too busy, or look, you can't come into the club because of X, Y, and Z, and you know, that unfortunately will be a situation now with COVID and the strict criteria and rules we'll have for, for people coming into clubs, but you know, we've got to be more open in terms of sports science community and how we work with each other, and again, open with coaches, open in terms of coach education and, and everything we do, and I think if we can come together and do that, then there's an exciting future ahead for for the sports science role in, in football and you know, where the game will progress to in the next 20, 30 years. Yeah, fully agree. That's awesome, mate. I think we got through some good stuff there. I really um, think there's some great takeaways from everything we spoke about. So I appreciate you coming on and, and giving up your time because I think there's, there's some top stuff in there, Graham. But do you want to just... Um, Give us some, some contacts, some places where people can get in touch with you if they've got questions or anything they want to reach out. Yeah, probably the the best one, Ben, is just via LinkedIn. Just uh, Graham Henderson on LinkedIn, uh, G-R-A-E-M-E. That's the, the funny Scottish spelling we've got, you know. <laughs> but um, anything on LinkedIn, if they want to drop me a message on that. Um, one thing I don't have is Twitter. I've never ever been into Twitter for some reason. So uh, if they want to go on that or you know, if they want to get in contact with, with Falkirk Football Club to, to get in touch with myself, um, then obviously that's an option as well. And like I've said, you know, I think anybody that is listening, I, I would thoroughly get in touch with the Scottish FA regarding that kind of idea of, of going on coaching courses and um, you know, trying to upskill their knowledge, particularly just now. People can't do a lot because of the, the pandemic and the restrictions, but the uh, association are doing a great job putting out coaching courses via Zoom. So um, it's a, a good chance for people to have a look at those. Brilliant. Yeah, and if anyone wants to reach out to us as well, we can always put them in your direction too. So I do encourage people to get in touch. It's always great to hear takeaways and um, what people have taken from the episode. So, but again... Massive thanks for coming on, mate. Really appreciate it. And um, hopefully we'll catch up soon. Perfect. Thanks for having me, Ben. Like I said, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks, Graham. Cheers.